Well, a lot of the social determinants of health that we look at really tend to focus around areas of health when we think about housing and infrastructure. And so, particularly in northern communities, the state of the housing actually has a very widespread effect on health, physical and mental health for people within communities. And that's, a t so that's attached to sort of a much larger system when we think about how to store the food, how to uh, bring food into community, what is the capacity of the airport even. So those are very infrastructural things of how to store the food and how to bring it there, but also housing is a very, very large part of health in northern communities, particularly for the lack of it. And that impacts people socially and physically in their health. So the physical aspect of health in terms of uh, the condition of mold, uh, the condition of buildings, we actually have them warm and safe. At the same point in time when we think about housing, that it is a place where um, the social well-being of a household is, and if people are overcrowded, which is very common in northern communities, uh, that they're uh, participating in social stresses that many people would not have to have in other situations. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if there's 12 people living inside of a two-bedroom home, there's lots of social interactions that are happening there because people are living in very close quarters and may not be living with people that they want to live with. And that has a very large impact on physical and mental well-being. So a lot of people in northern communities are employed or either on Ontario Works. Uh, interestingly enough, Ontario Works with the housing supplement and a, a privately employed person in a northern community is almost equal. Uh, when you're thinking of an individual person, slightly more when you're thinking of people having employment either through their band or through a company. Um, but what I'm, the reason why I'm saying that is because when we think about what it costs to actually insure and maintain a home, that takes away at least 30 to 40 percent of the income of people coming into the home. So then we, if you have two-thirds left to pay for your other things, in northern areas, if something costs 99 cents in Thunder Bay, let's say, in a remote northern community, it would cost between three and five dollars. And so the impact that that has of people having money left over to spend on food, particularly healthy, nutritious food, which is more difficult to store, more difficult to ship through the airports, more difficult to keep, therefore significantly more expensive, it has a very large impact on what people are consuming uh, in northern communities in terms of being safe, nutritious food, but also being able to have, when we look at the true definition of food security, it's about safe, nutritious, affordable food for people to live a safe and healthy life. Whereas if people aren't allowed to afford French fruits and vegetables and they're only able to consume processed foods, that has a very large impact on their health. So Anishinaabe Aski Nation has had a very, which is, sorry, Anishinaabe Aski Nation is a large area in Northern Ontario about the size of France. And they've had 32 boiled water advisories that have been going on for over two decades in each community. A number of them are being fixed under the current government. But the interesting thing is that people have been um, taught through having these boiled water advisories to use either boil their water or to consume bottled water. And I was just in a community last week and I was speaking to someone and they said, you know, we're going to be getting this new plant that's going to lift the boil of water advisory but we're not sure of actually how much impact it's going to make on people's lives because people will continue to not trust the system, not trust the fact that the pipes are fine, not trust the fact they'll be thinking of the contaminants because for decades or for generations, let's say, they've been having boil water advisories. And when I actually think about the boil water advisory and impacting people in terms of consuming water that's bad, but if you actually begin to think of the stress that it puts on people to be in an area that has a boiled water advisory. So for instance, that water may not be safe for them to use on their skin to shower with because they'll get a rash. Uh, when you have to boil water for 20 to 30 minutes every time you go to cook with it, that's extra stress of time that's used within it. And also the extra stress of turning on the water and being unsure of knowing what's coming out of it, out of the tap, so even after the boil water advisories are lifted, it will be interesting to actually think of how long it's going to take for people to not have that questioning and keep acting as if they're under a boil water advisory. And the interesting thing that happens is there's actually an impact on housing from the water advisories. Because if you are boiling water in a house every single time you boil water for 20 to 30 minutes, you emit all of this moisture out into the house. And most houses in southern Ontario, let alone the ones in the far north that are already dealing with lots of vapor problems. They're even more impacted, so they're even in a higher level, a higher instance 
of uh, having mold within their households because of all of this extra water that's out in the air because people are boiling water at such a rate. And let's just keep in mind that that's 12 people in a household, so that's even more water that's being boiled and kept boiled for a long time.